Tonight, CBC learns the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan bought shares in a company that runs U.S. migrant detention centers. This doesn't match our values. This shouldn't have slipped through the cracks. That's the bottom line. Those shares have since been sold, but teachers and human rights advocates are still looking for answers. Plus... The city's ombudsman says this arrest by fair inspectors wasn't properly investigated by the TTC. And solidarity with protesters in Hong Kong. Torontonians expressed their support through sticky notes. Good evening, I'm Mike Wise. Two Canadian pension plans are under scrutiny tonight for investigating in company, investing rather, in companies that run the migrant detention centers in the U.S. Those have been long criticized for inhumane conditions. Now, many of those centers are run by some of the largest private prison operators in the U.S. And until recently, an investor in one operator was the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan. Lauren Pelly has the story. Migrant detention centers south of the border have stirred controversy amid allegations of subpar medical care, poor living conditions and segregation. Activists have brought their fight to the streets and right to the doorsteps of multiple facilities. Many of the sites are owned by GEO Group, and a report from the internal watchdog for U.S. Homeland Security said conditions at one of the company's California facilities may violate detainees' rights. And that's why there was such a concern and such a, an uproar from members across Ontario, because this doesn't match our values. Outcry was swift from Teachers Online after CBC Toronto first reported this morning the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan invested more than half a million dollars in the private prison operator in the first quarter of this year. The Alberta Pension Plan, a Crown Corporation, invested close to $5 million in both Geo Group and another prison operator. The uh, idea of having uh, pension funds and, and others invested in companies that may be associated with human rights abuses is very is very troubling. I think this is a time when, when people should be being careful about uh, what it is that their investments are funding. CBC News reached out to both pension plans for their response. Representatives from Alberta didn't comment, but a spokesperson for the Ontario Teachers Pension Plan said it did have shares in Geo Group, but divested them in early April. In a statement, the spokesperson said, we regret holding exposure to this stock. Our members care deeply about human rights and we are committed to investing responsibly. Some Ontario teachers who were gathered for a conference today in Ottawa want to make sure it's a promise that's upheld. This shouldn't have slipped through the cracks. That's the bottom line. Even though it is a very small amount, we're talking about $500,000 in a $191 billion plan. That's very small, but it's significant because it sends a message. And teachers want to make sure that our, you know, that the investments that the plan makes matches the values that we promote in the classroom every day. This is also not the first time a Canadian organization has backed away from this type of controversial investment. Last year, The Guardian reported that the Canadian pension plan's investment arm had purchased more than $10 million in shares in these two private prison companies. They've since sold those off. Lauren Pelly, CBC News, Toronto. And an update now on that Air Canada flight that made an emergency landing in Honolulu. All passengers have been assessed and now released from hospital. Now the flight from Toronto to Sydney via Vancouver experienced some severe turbulence, leaving 37 people injured and in need of medical care. And we have some new video of the immediate aftermath. This shared online by an Australian band on board the flight. Oxygen masks dropped and people struggling to figure out what to do next. The flight was about two hours past Hawaii when unexpected turbulence hit. The seatbelt sign was off at the time and the sudden drop caused some to fly from their seats, hitting their heads on the roof or in overhead compartments. At Honolulu's airport, passengers described what happened. The seatbelt signs were on. We had no indication that anything was going to happen. There wasn't even a rumble in the plane and then just... Yeah, just dropped. We hit turbulence and we all hit the roof and everything fell down and stuff. So people went flying. The lady in front of me flew right out of her seat. She said she had her seat belt on, so it's possible that in the turbulence that released and she flew up and hit her head. I tried to grab her and hold her down. Now the passengers are praising how the Air Canada air crew handled this and the decision to turn the flight around to attend to the injuries. 
Air Canada says it has arranged hotels for all the passengers and they are now scheduled to fly out to Sydney tomorrow afternoon. Toronto police are looking for two men after a violent robbery and sexual assault downtown. They say the men were in an elevator with a 19-year-old woman early yesterday morning in the King and Bathurst area and they tried to rob her of her phone. That's when one of the men pulled out a gun. The woman was then violently dragged from the elevator and sexually assaulted by both men in a stairwell. After, police say the men went into the underground parking garage and fled in a vehicle, a grey or silver four-door Mazda with damage to the rear passenger side bumper. Anyone who knows who these men are is asked to get in touch with police. And another pedestrian fatality to tell you about. This one near a construction site in Richmond Hill. A pickup truck struck and killed a man as he walked in the area. It happened at Young Street and Garden Avenue. After about 5.30 tonight, police say the man died at the scene. The Ministry of Labor is investigating. Outside Union Station today, a, symbol a symbolic wall went up. It's built by a group of citizens concerned about recent developments in Hong Kong. Thousands of people there have been taking to the streets for over a month now, protesting a controversial amendment to an extradition bill. As Kelda Yoon tells us, the wall is one of several around the world being built to show solidarity. Show that you care about Hong Kong, show that you care about democracy. Outside Toronto's busiest transit station, people stop to write messages of support to protesters in Hong Kong. It's because they have been uh, under very hard days. Kenny Yu is part of a group from Toronto's Hong Kong community that came up with the idea to erect a Lenin wall, mimicking similar ones that have sprung up all over Hong Kong and in cities like Vancouver. All these things that you see here is actually going to be, we, we all are going to send photos back and then they will know they are not alone. The streets of Hong Kong have overflowed with protesters for over a month now, sparked by a proposed amendment to an extradition law that would allow suspects to be sent to mainland China to face trial under the ruling Communist Party. We are under the um, one country, two systems thing, but then and we're still under that until like 2047, I think, yep. And it, like it's 2019 right now, there's still a long way to go and they're already taking our way, our, our rights and our freedoms. Maria Leung was born in Hong Kong. She said she stopped to post a message of support because it's the least she can do from half a world away. Earlier this week, Hong Kong's chief executive, Carrie Lam, declared that the bill was dead, but protesters are not buying it. She has to say it's going to be withdrawn. She never used any legal words in response to anything. I think if it is really officially uh, going to be withdrawn or cancelled by uh, them, well, officially you will need to put it inside and discuss inside the legislative council and have the legislative council to confirm the cancellation. The group says they will be back here tomorrow for another protest and they say they will continue to organize events to show their solidarity until this amendment is completely withdrawn. Kelda Yoon, CBC News, Toronto. Nick Sarnkovich is here with his first look at the forecast. And Nick, with all that humidity in the air, it wasn't a surprise we saw some rain in some spots. Yeah, no doubt about it, Mike. In fact, we had some good thunderstorms across the GTA, not necessarily downtown Toronto, but in areas across the GTA. That was along a cold front, and with that, we're actually seeing uh, drier air move in behind it. So tonight, it's going to be drier, but not for long. Humidity returns. We do, however, have lots in the way of sunshine in the forecast. Now, temperatures today actually hit 30 degrees with the Humidex. It was pretty close to 40, at least that's how it felt. Uh, but drier air moving in as we move through tomorrow. A little bit of cloud cover through tonight. By tomorrow afternoon, things start to clear out. And then we're uh, into sunshine until about Saturday when we could see a few more spotty thunderstorms. For tonight, 17 degrees. Tomorrow, 28, but feels only 31. However, as I said, that humidity is coming back. Full details in a bit. Oh, only feels 31. That's right. Okay, thanks, Nick. <laughs> Well, Toronto's ombudsman is slamming a TTC investigation into the actions of three of its transit officers. It involves an aggressive takedown of a young black man on a streetcar last year. In this case, the ombudsman didn't look at that actual incident, but rather how the transit agency conducted its own review. Lorenda Redekop explains. 
The incident was caught on video, shot by another TTC passenger. That's Reese Maxwell Crawford, a young black man, on the ground. The TTC's investigation found the only area of misconduct was when one fare inspector smiles during a tense interaction. It also accepted the account of one fare inspector that before the takedown, Maxwell Crawford stared at him for a prolonged period of time. Susan Opler is Toronto's ombudsman. She says that's not the case watching the video, one of several discrepancies she found in the TTC report. The first fare inspector, as well as an independent witness, said that they felt uncomfortable because this young man had uh, his hands in his pockets and they feared that he might have a weapon. In fact, he does not have his hands in his pockets at any point on the video. Maxwell Crawford's lawyer says the report backs up his argument that the TTC's investigation was a cover-up for its staff. Taking the evidence of someone who's contradicted by the videotape evidence as if it were a fact. And it, it, it's profoundly disturbing. And especially when that stuff relates to the issue of whether there was racial, racial profiling happening here. One of the fair inspectors involved that day no longer works at the TTC. The two others do. The transit agency says it accepts all six of the ombudsman's recommendations and that it's going further by starting an anti-racism task force. I have a zero tolerance for racism within the organization. All right, just the perception or uh, the concern of the public of racism really is troubling to me personally and professionally. No one should uh, feel uncomfortable. We want everyone to feel safe. As for how Maxwell Crawford is now, more than a year later. He's trying to recover from the injuries that he sustained in this. And the, I mean, he still struggles with a lack of trust with respect to law enforcement and even the TTC. So it's an ongoing problem. He's continuing with a multi-million dollar lawsuit against the TTC and police. Lorenda Redekop, CBC News, Toronto. An expansion to Toronto's bike share program means a much larger coverage area, more than 1,200 new bikes and 105 new docking stations. I'm Greg Ross. I'll have details coming up. Canadian rock star Jacob Hogard wants his sex assault case to go before a jury. The singer with the band Headley made that request at a preliminary hearing today at Old City Hall Courthouse. Do you have any comments on the allegations? Do you have any comments on the allegations? Hogard pleaded not guilty to two counts of sexual assault causing bodily harm and one count of sexual interference. Police say the charges relate to incidents in Toronto involving a woman and a girl under the age of 16. Today was the first of a two-day hearing to decide whether the case goes to trial. The allegations prompted his ban to go on an indefinite hiatus. Now back to that tragic news from Oakville we first reported last night. A child pulled from a backyard pool is now in stable condition. A four-year-old aunt girl and her 79-year-old grandmother were both found unconscious in the water yesterday afternoon. Emergency crews tried to revive the grandmother, but she died at the scene. The coroner will look into whether some sort of medical incident contributed to the woman's death. You'll soon be seeing more of those City of Toronto bikes around town. The bike share program is set for a major expansion, one that will see thousands of bikes and hundreds of docking stations added to the network. Greg Ross has the details. This is an important part of our public transportation system. The mayor was in the East End today to announce the latest expansion to Toronto's bike share program. They're adding more than 1,200 new bikes and 105 new docking stations. The mayor says it's necessary to meet the growing demand. The ridership has grown to more than 2 million rides per year. Also growing is the program's coverage area. This new expansion means you can now pick up a bike as far east as Victoria Park Avenue to as far as Humber Bay Park in the west. There are also stations as far north as Young and Lawrence. Welcome news for Stephen Ron, who lives in the beaches. He tried the bike share program for the first time today. I just live right around the corner, so I came from downtown. One thing that hasn't changed is the length of a single trip. Riders are still expected to check in every half hour. Ron didn't check in. It ended up costing him an extra $4. Maybe they should look at that. 
you know, make it because a half an hour it doesn't get you downtown. Some people might wonder why you have to check in every 30 minutes. Why is that? Yeah, well, it's really important that a ridership, when they when they want to take a, a bike out, that a bike is available. It's more about getting from point A to point B. That, that's exactly it. We want people to be able to take a ride when, when they need to. For $4, you can keep it out longer. Um, but again, you know, the overall price is very low. The mayor says it's all about complementing the city's public transportation. Many of the new bike share Toronto locations will be near TTC subway stations because we want to encourage people to use this as part of the last mile and as part of encouraging people not just to use bikes to get around the city but also to use uh, the public transit system as well. The latest expansion brings the total number of bikes in the program up to 5,000. Another expansion is planned for next year where they're hoping to get that number to 6,000. Greg Ross, CBC News, Toronto. These are not bicycles. The roar of the lake shores this weekend. The Honda Indy. Toronto is back for its 33rd year. The 11-turn temporary circuit runs almost 3 kilometers using st streets surrounding Exhibition Place. That will mean road closures. You can check out a full list of those online. But looking ahead to the big race, Canada's best shot at a win is superstar racer James Hinchcliffe. My colleague Chris Glover spoke with him earlier today. Put a tremendous amount of pressure on myself to do well for Canada. I'm a, you know, I'm a very proud Canadian. And You're the Raptors of racing. Yeah, exactly right. Exactly. Right. The Jays, the Raptors, we're the, one, the yes. only one, you know. And it's, uh, it's a huge honor, obviously, to, to be able to represent my country like that. And the support that I felt from back home has just been incredible since day one. But because of that support, I want to give them something to cheer for, you know. Canadians really get behind their athletes and, and we love performing and, and really giving them a reason to cheer and support. And Fan Friday kicks off tomorrow. The main race goes on Sunday. Stick around. We're back after this break. The weather update is brought to you by Train Extreme Conditions Testing. It's hard to stop a train. Really hard. Train, the most reliable heating and cooling brand. We have a story tonight about a man who is racing against time to prove that he is a Canadian. He has a Canadian-issued birth certificate, but apparently that won't do the trick. Angelina King explains why. You have to go to the Department of National Serge Defense. Curry was born in Germany in 1966. His parents were serving in the Canadian Air Force. When he was one, they moved back to Canada. He's been here ever since. Curry found his birth certificate doesn't actually prove his citizenship when he tried renewing his health card two years ago. I plopped this on the table and she goes, what is this? And I go, that's my birth certificate. You want a driver's license birth certificate? This ain't no birth certificate. Curry has a Department of National Defense birth certificate. Canada issued them between 1963 and 1979. All it's good for is proving his age. This has been like super stressful for me. I, I'm close to a nervous breakdown. For the past two years, he's been trying to get his proof of Canadian citizenship. Curry says it took months before he could even figure out that's what he needed. He didn't hear anything for months after he applied. Turns out the documents were sent. He never got them. Can you reissue it? And they said, no, you, di you didn't call us back in time. Immigration, Refugees and Citizenship Canada says that's because it had been more than 180 days. Three months ago, he applied again. It's being processed, but the clock is ticking. If I don't have a health card, I can't get my medicine. Curry is diabetic. His health card expires next month. He needs his proof of citizenship to renew it. In a statement, IRCC says in part, Given that current processing times for proof of application is five months, this application is within established processing times. An immigration lawyer we spoke with says while he's never dealt with a case like this one before, he's not surprised because he says there's a lot of different types of birth certificates out there and delays in a process like this one are quite common. They're not handing these out willy-nilly. They want to be sure before they give it. But, you know, it's a government, it's a bureaucracy, mistakes are made and things take time. He advises Canadian parents to get proof of citizenship right away if a child is born abroad. Curry wants others to learn from him. I'm hoping someone else can go just go, wow, I have that card. I better do something before I'm in trouble. He hopes to have all of his documents in September. 
Then he can apply for his first Canadian passport and celebrate his official citizenship by relaxing in Hawaii. Angelina King, CBC News, Toronto. Nick is back with his extended forecast, and to start things off, you're looking at the extended Humidex forecast. I am, and you know, we were just saying earlier on that if I had said 31 for a Humidex a while back, we would have all been saying, oh my goodness, that's so warm. And now that's actually a bit of a relief. Take a look at the forecast for the next seven days. Now, uh, tomorrow about 31, 32 across the GTA. It goes back up to 35, though, by the time we hit Saturday. Sunday, it kind of drops. But look at this in Tuesday. I think we're actually going to exceed the 40 mark with the Humidex on Tuesday. And then Wednesday, Thursday, pretty humid as well. So lots of heat and humidity in the forecast coming up over the next uh, seven days. In terms of cloud cover and precipitation, not much of it actually. Tonight, some cloud cover over the GTA. Same story through tomorrow morning. But by that, the time we hit tomorrow afternoon, things clear out. We're into the sunshine. A little bit in the way of rainfall and some spotty thunderstorms starting sort of to the north Saturday morning. This along another system, another front that's going to move through. And that's going to drop humidity again for Sunday, as you saw in that Humidex forecast there. However, in the long-range forecast, that's about it for the precipitation. Otherwise, pretty sunny right the way through. Down in southwestern Ontario tonight, temperatures will sit around 17, 18 degrees. Again, drier weather in the forecast as well. By tomorrow, sunshine temperatures around 28, 29 degrees and Humidex values in the neighborhood of about 31 to 33. For the GTA and the Golden Horseshoe, uh, we're looking at temperatures around 16, 17 degrees, so a little cooler than what we've been used to. Also fresher as well. If you leave your window open at nighttime, you're going to notice the difference tonight uh, as that humidity has sort of left us. By tomorrow afternoon, the temperature up to 28 degrees in the city. So that's only about two degrees off of what we had today, but the Humidex uh, quite a bit less, around 31 to 33 for tomorrow. Long range forecast, that's what it looks like. And I threw the Humidex values on the bottom there just for uh, reference, but 27 degrees, uh, things clearing out for tomorrow, um, 28 on Saturday. Sunday, uh, slightly cooler, still about seasonal, slightly cooler and drier as well. But we start that climb into next Tuesday. I think next Tuesday we're looking at high of about 32 degrees, but a Humidex about 40, 41. Mike. All, right. All right, thanks a lot, Nick. You bet. You know I like it when your body goes yeah. bum, bum, bum. Come on, don't stop, let's go, let's go, come on. Well, the lineup for this year's OVO Festival is out, and reaction from our newsroom is that Drake appears to be bringing back the early 2000s with his choice of acts. B2K, Mario, Chingy, the Ying Yang Twins, well, they're all set to perform at the Budweiser stage on August 4th. Drake will headline on the 5th. Tickets go on sale tomorrow. At least I heard a Drake in that list. Well, still with music, you might want to give Q's music panel a listen tomorrow, where they'll be discussing this week's biggest new releases and asking a big question about what's missing on this year's charts. Whatever happened to the slow jam? You can hear that tomorrow starting at 10 a.m. on CBC Radio 1. I'll see you back here tomorrow night at 11. Good night. Mm -hmm.